So I think we can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to day two of our summer school. And uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our first speaker, Professor David DiVincenzo. So uh, David uh, DiVincenzo was, uh, did his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, finished in the 80s, and then did a postdoc at Cornell and joined the research team at IBM, which uh, where he did a lot of the real pioneering work that we're familiar with uh, in quantum information and quantum computation. Uh, many people are familiar with the DiVincenzo criteria, uh, some of the first conditions for uh, building a quantum computer, uh, and as well the lost DiVincenzo uh, architecture for a solid state quantum computer. Then in 2011, uh, he moved to Europe and uh, is working here, primary appointment at Forschungszentrum Jülich at the Institute of Theoretical Nanoelectronics, where he is the director. Uh, so without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Drimmer, and hello, everyone listening and out there on YouTube also, I guess. Um, so um, today I will continue, and uh, let me, without further ado, uh, get my screen share. Um, but as you'll see, I have kind of a hybrid lecture for you because I, um, uh, I always believe it, when you go to school, you should have a teacher writing on the blackboard. So I want to do a little bit of that uh, uh, to, uh, uh, well, give us a, give a real lesson about something. But a lot of this will also be just a, um, a survey or a set of opinions, perhaps, about uh, where we are on uh, uh, building the tools for quantum computing, mostly. Uh, I know my title said quantum information, and I, I love quantum information also, but I am very busy with quantum computing these days, as I've been off and on for a long time. And uh, I will have many opinions to give you about architectures. You've already seen a dose of it from uh, Andreas Valroff yesterday, um, uh, but uh, maybe I'll give you a little bit more of a map of, uh, of that. <clears throat> okay, but uh, let me begin. I, I need to set up my own screen a little bit differently. Okay, now I'm pretty much set here. Um, so that's who I am. That's where we are. Uh, too bad we're not in person. Uh, maybe in another few months we would have been able to, but um, well, this is what we can do for the time being. Uh, so I thought I would again begin with uh, Feynman. Uh, uh, not to prove that Feynman was so smart, but uh, he was pretty smart. And he uh, realized certain things very early, but he was also kind of lazy that I actually he didn't follow up many of his wonderful thoughts. And um, so I can also offer some criticism of him. But as you see here in 1959, he um, already felt there was something missing. And uh, uh, this is a famous lecture that he gave uh, which also in some sense uh, started or was an inspiration for the subsequent, uh, you know, nano subject, nanotechnology. Um, uh, but he reflected on the fact in his APS talk that, um, that uh, machines were getting smaller and computers were getting smaller, but they weren't too small in 1959, but I guess they had gone from, you know, vacuum tube things to transistors. So they had uh, gone an order of magnitude smaller perhaps uh, but he extrapolated downward and he said there's plenty of room at the bottom and what he meant by is the bottom of the length scale. He might have also meant the bottom of the energy scale, but he explicitly says about length that he says maybe machines will, the sizes of machines will be measured in atom sizes like seven atoms or something like that. And then he uh, he very well understood that the physical laws would have to be different, uh, would be, uh, would describe that machine uh, differently. Um, and uh, so he knew it had to be quantum mechanics. And then he even says something that maybe we have to use the quantized energy levels, maybe we have to use spins. Uh, he didn't get much deeper than that. I, I believe it's in this lecture that he also gave as a, as a challenge to uh, make a fully functioning electric motor that was like this big. And then a month later, somebody did it. Uh, so it was indeed possible you know, miniaturization was a theme even then, but became, you know, a bigger theme. This, this is before Moore's law, but uh, uh, Moore codified the fact that we would be uh, running computers at a smaller and smaller and smaller scale. Um, now, uh, 
I also come to this famous high point that you've heard about already, but we'll hear way more about tomorrow. So it's not my job to lecture about this, but I'm gonna give you some background about this. Um, so 35 years later, um, after Feynman's first uh, declarations on this subject, um, uh, we have this you know, great high point of quantum computing theory, uh, the result that you can uh, extract prime factors efficiently but via quantum computation. The thing I like to emphasize is that um, in those intervening 35 years, there was absolutely nothing fundamental, fundamentally new that was discovered about quantum mechanics. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if sure, if one could have moved, sent Shore back in time to 1959 and uh, put him in front of the blackboard with Feynman, he could have in a morning explained it and it would have all been clear to Feynman. There was no uh, new physical insights that were needed. Um, so, well, one can give various crit critiques about that or observations about it. It says that a lot of people missed it. You know, we could have uh, in fact gone right ahead and done it. And uh, my own view is that it's because people weren't didn't really believe quantum mechanics. It sounds kind of strange to say, but they didn't believe all of its implications. You know, they sure they believed that it explained the G factor of the electron, uh, or that they explained, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the structure of nuclei, uh, but they didn't believe that it could, you know, uh, explain all explain engineered phenomena, or that you could actually engineer towards quantum things. And this certainly implied, I mean, when I say this, the Shor algorithm implied a lot of engineering. Uh, uh, now, as I said, you're, you're going to get more about, uh, about the Shor algorithm tomorrow, but uh, I'm going to fill, in, fill you in. I've been asked, in fact, to fill you in on a few specifics, but in fact, it's a good, um, I I'm going to zero in on one particular aspect of the Shor algorithm, which tells us things about, al about architectures, uh, which will be the main topic of my uh, lecture today. Um, so I'm going to proceed to, um, to kind of uh, unpack uh, this. So there's uh, the implied uh, quantum mechanical machine. Uh, by contrast to the classical machine, you know, this, uh, this slide still tells the story about uh, the, uh, you know, this particular integer, this particular 129 digit integer and how it was uh, cooked up uh, by uh, the cryptographers of the time in the 1970s and offered as a puzzle for uh, computer enthusiasts find the prime factors of this number. Because um, they knew them, but it was hard to compute them. Eventually people did compute them, but it involved a really big uh, classical computation. I'm showing here like NAND gates or something to, uh, to schematize what actually went on in these uh, hundreds of computers that were cooperatively uh, working to factor this particular number. Here, here are the factors if you want to write them down. Um, and, uh, but Shor showed that by a quantum mechanical process, um, so some other kind of computing process, one could in a very small number of steps, uh, K being the number of digits, the 129 say, uh, in K squared steps or less, uh, uh, one could uh, obtain the very same answer that you can get with the classical machines with apparently some kind of exponential uh, scaling of the, uh, of the number of elementary computational steps. Now, uh, <clears throat> Shor recognized, here, here's a blank page, and I'm, so I'm going to now revert to uh, uh, teacher style and uh, talk on the blackboard, so to speak. So Shor, um, uh, algorithm, the algorithm for factoring involves three big blocks. One is you just call make superpositions. Um, the next big block is uh, conventional arithmetic. Um, uh, actually what's called modular exponentiation. Uh, I won't talk about those right now, but um, uh, the, and then the final step is an intrinsically quantum mechanical step called the quantum Fourier transform. <clears throat> uh, 
And uh, I might say the just historical observation that, um, you know, Shor's uh, paper was sort of perfect. That is, he wrote a paper in 1994, it had the whole story. You know, it was a full, complete proof and, uh, you know, fully recognized that these things would work with the exception of his um, <clears throat> understanding of this step. Uh, he had an understanding of it, but it was a very immature understanding and uh, we never ever teach it anymore. The very convoluted arguments that he had in his first paper on why you could do a quantum Fourier transform and why it could in principle be efficient. Um, uh, but it was actually the work of the follow-up work, which occurred actually in our laboratory of uh, Don Coppersmith, um, who actually understood how to make this uh, much smoother. Uh, Shor's arguments were not incorrect, but um, he found a way which subsequently is the way we always explain the quantum Fourier transform and uh, like it's codified in Nielsen and Chuang. Um, his, his work is not even published except that it's his report on it is on, on the archive, uh, so it can be found. Um, and, uh, and it had immediate actually architectural significance or, or implications, uh, it told us things about um, what it meant, uh, it, what, what sort of modularity this Q box should have, which is already implied by my little sketch here. That is that uh, I, I imply um, uh, the kind of quote, obvious thing that you should do one and two qubit gates in succession. That's what we always are told about quantum algorithms, but this was not known to Shor. And uh, he did not understand the possibility of modular, modularizing the quantum computation in this way. And it was most evident in his treatment of the quantum Fourier transform. Uh, but let me run through um, a little lesson on what is our current understanding, I mean, current since Coppersmith's uh, analysis of the quantum Fourier transform. And it will get us to explicit uh, quantum gates that we need to uh, focus on. And that has been a kind of a continuous focus ever since, um, and uh, all sort of machine building is focused on, you know, can you make these gates? Can you make these one qubit gates? Can you make these two qubit gates? Um, so, but uh, to see that you have to see how the quantum Fourier transform works. Uh, I mean, subsequently that was understood to be a completely universal observation that, uh, that you could modularize quantum uh, computation in that uh, fashion. Also an insight of our group at IBM, I might say. Um, Okay, but uh, so let me uh, now give you uh, the basics of the QFT. Uh, first of all, I'll begin by talking about its close relative, the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, in, uh, when you're doing a discrete Fourier transform, you have a list of numbers. Let me call it like a vector of numbers x, um, x0, x1, uh, a few of these things will set my notation X sub capital N minus one. And these X's are all uh, complex numbers. And uh, the job of the Fourier transform is to produce another list of complex numbers of the same length um, given by this formula, um, one over the square root of N. This factor is sort of optional. That is when you learn Fourier transforms in school, um, <clears throat> sometimes you're not, not given it with this factor, but this is the sort of symmetric uh, factor so that the inverse Fourier transform has the same uh, prefactor. And that's actually very important for the, uh, you know, jumping it over to the quantum mechanical um, uh, uh, story. Uh, now I, uh, okay, this is perfectly ordinary. The uh, integers here, j and k, again, run from zero to n minus one. And the thing that uh, needs to be emphasized um, is that, uh, well, which is uh, kind of a triviality on the classical side, but actually is important from dis for discussing other quantum algorithms, is that this is ordinary um, integer multiplication. Uh, because, or the reason I emphasize that is if you use, uh, in brackets, if you use uh, bitwise uh, 
multiplication instead. Um, this gets you to another interesting Fourier transform, the so-called Z2 Fourier transform. And that's the thing that's involved in the Simon algorithm, which was the immediate uh, predecessor of the Shore algorithm. So that's just an aside here. Um, but indeed, Shore wants, or we need this, this Fourier transform with integer multiplication with all of its you know, potential complications. You need uh, carry bits and things like that. Um, so, but nevertheless, uh, well, we know nevertheless that if you have um, bitwise things, so um, what I mean by that is if the, uh, if N is a, is a power of two, which we will uh, proceed with here, then you know that there are very fast methods of doing this sum classically. And uh, it turns out that it's, uh, uh, there is indeed also a classical, I'm sorry, there's also a, a good quantum way of doing it, not so closely related to the FFT. So uh, one should view that as perhaps slightly an accident. Um, okay, so uh, we want the quantum version. So the quantum version um, is that we want to be in Hilbert space. <clears throat> and we say we have a vector in Hilbert space. Uh, first, I'll do it not, in, not with this power of two notation, but the J is just a vector in Hilbert space of the same dimension as above. So it uh, n dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And under the action of this QFT, in other words, the box up here. Um, uh, Shore said, uh, not, uh, not just Shore, uh, it wasn't needed, uh, Coppersmith wasn't needed for this. Shore recognized that one needed to be able to do this, uh, that it, all the same factors appear here again, sum over k from zero to n minus one, um, exactly the same exponential factor, e to the two pi i j k over n, uh, and then, uh, basis vector k. So that's the definition of the uh, Fourier transform. Um, I know it's, if you take a course, you know, with Nielsen Chuang, I believe there's an exercise that says, prove that this is a unitary transformation. Um, I won't uh, prove it in the way that they had in mind, but in a sense, the derivation that I'm about to offer you, I probably have another 20 minutes of uh, story about this. Um, uh, effectively does prove that this is a, um, uh, is, um, is a unitary transformation because it's implementable by a composition of unitary one and two qubit gates. And that's what I'm gonna to proceed to uh, construct for you. Um, just as a further point, of course, because it's a quantum Fourier tra transform, it works in superposition. So if you had, and this is sort of illustrates its relation to the discrete Fourier transform, that if you had a superposition in this Hilbert space, um, say uh, uh, with these uh, this vector or this set of coefficients x sub i, that under the quantum Fourier transform, it would go to a superposition in that same Hilbert space. Um, I'll use a different dummy index though with the coefficients y sub k. So that's another you know point to make of how it's related to this. Um, how it's related to the concept of the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, so now let me really get to the um, uh, so new page. So we uh, continue on this line, but we really stick with this, um, uh, say that the Hilbert space is a power of two. And uh, uh, given that, we will then note that the integers j, we have j and k integers, and uh, these integers are representable as n bit numbers. So uh, little n, n bit uh, numbers, n bit integers. So uh, no notationally then what I will write is uh, there's the most significant bit j1, there's the next most significant bit j2 dot, dot, dot. And then there's the least significant bit jn. And I will be very uh, pedantic. This is an integer, but I'll put like 0. 0.0. Um, yes, it is an integer, but I'll, this is just a way of noting that its fractional part is 0. Um, this is also to note that what this means is that we have a bit j1 times 2 to the n minus 1 plus a bit j2 times 2 to the n minus 2 plus dot, 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 plus j to sub n 2 to the 0th power, that that's the integer j. Um, now I introduced the uh, 
uh, seemingly extraneous uh, decimal point. But um, part of the trick of this uh, derivation of, of Coppersmith's insight, I would say, is to uh, you will want in this calculation to move this decimal point around. So you can have a number like this, which we will use uh, by the end of this uh, page, certainly. Uh, zero point, J1, J2, J3. We don't usually write uh, our fractions this way. We call this a decimal, but that's a bad word because this is not base 10. Uh, as far as I know, there's no convenient name for what this is. It's just some base two fractional notation. <clears throat> um, but this is, as you see, it's one half J1. A as a fraction, as an ordinary fraction, it's one half J1 plus one quarter J2 plus dot, dot, dot. Of course, it will end at Jn in the, um, so we'll have a terminating uh, quote decimal expansion, except we're doing bitwise. Um, so having that, um, having that notation in your head will help actually not, uh, takes about four steps for this to really help in the uh, working out of this derivation. So let me do a, a little derivation of illustrating how this uh, computation simplifies when you're doing this power of two. This is exactly what Shore did not realize. And he, he decided he needed to do his, um, his uh, Fourier transform. So aside about Shore, uh, by contrast, Shore's original thing, which you know, maybe is worth studying for people who want to learn you know, very complicated Fourier transforms, because he wanted the base not to be a power of two, but a product of distinct primes two times three times five times seven, et cetera. And uh, he only, he was able to do some analysis based on that uh, strange Fourier transform, um, uh, which meant he wasn't thinking in bits, uh, definitely for this part of, the, uh, of his construction of this, but we will definitely think in bits and qubits. Um, so let me just take the expressions that I had on the last uh, page that we, of course, our, Blackboard, so you can't see my last blackboard. So, uh, well, you'll see it eventually when you get the, uh, the slides back. Um, so we're just gonna rewrite what uh, the transformation is uh, under the QFT, but now specializing to this power of two. Um, I guess we call this radix two, uh, or some computer scientists would call that. Uh, this first line doesn't do anything, just reminds me that it's power of two. Uh, and I'll put in the power of two in the exponential, two pi i j k over two to the n, little nth power k. Uh, now we'll start using our bitwise, uh, you know, structure <clears throat> a little bit. So one over two to the n over two. Um, so I'm going to immediately recognize that k um, can be written out in bits, and then I'm going to decompose the sum into n sums, a little n sums, the first one being the sum of the first bit value, the most significant bit value of k, zero to one, the next most significant bit value, zero to one, et cetera, dot, 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 sum of k sub n of zero to one, um, e to the two pi i. Um, I'll keep j as an un, unmanipulated integer at the moment, but I've introduced all this, these bits for uh, K, so I'm going to write that out. L equals one to N, uh, K sub L two to the minus L. The minus L uh, came from the fact that there was this, um, remember there's a two to the N in the denominator here, and that uh, demotes the, uh, the, the uh, power of two down to negative powers, in fact in this, but otherwise it's closely related to this uh, expansion. Well, it's actually very closely related to this expansion as you'll see uh, shortly. And uh, of course I've missed the fact that we're in Hilbert space. Uh, so we have to write the uh, ket, but now the ket, uh, let me stick with my, whoops, sorry, stick with my color coding here. Um, color coding says, okay, K1, K2, K3, et cetera, Kn. So that's just a, another uh, label for that same ket, but we're going to recognize that we are going to do bits. So in the very next line, I'm going to pull this apart into bits, into qubits, I mean, in the Hilbert space, two to the n over two, I guess I won't do that much otherwise. So I still have all these sums over k uh, unchanged. <clears throat> um, 
now I'm going to, uh, however, uh, write this or recall that this is a tensor product. So as K1 tensor product, K2 tensor product, K3, well, I say recall, I believe all of you are pretty advanced students. So uh, nobody's taught that in this summer school, but uh, I mean, every child knows this by now, I guess. Uh, uh, every child who's been to the right graduate school, I guess. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to pull that apart and uh, use instead of the uh, little O times, this is a, like a backslash O times in, uh, in uh, LaTeX, but there's a backslash big O times, which we use for this, which is uh, by analogy to using, uh, you know, well, where will I put this? Remember CF product rule, you know, use a big pi for products, but we use a big O times for tensor products. And this is from L to one to N. Um, and then the factors, I, I will now pull apart the, um, the exponential into its different pieces, two pi i j. Uh, remember the i is the square root of minus one. So there's no confusing, the i is never a summation index in this derivation. Um, and now I only have one of these power, one of these uh, pieces, k l two to the minus l, um, uh, using you know the product uh, sums turn into products uh, in exponentials. So oh, and that's not a two, that's an e. Um, so e to the two pi i. So um, yeah, when you don't do PowerPoint, you get to see the uh, the uh, all the wrong mental processes of the lecturer. Uh, which he can get to fix, then you can be busy thinking about other aspects of the confusing derivation, hopefully not too confusing. Okay, that's the end of the, the new expression. Now we pull this apart into mostly, or pretty much pull this apart into bits, uh, but we can take all these summations also, um, some, you know, this is some K1, K2, recognize that each of these summations uh, only uh, acts in one, uh, only one unique, one particular one of these tensor powers. And so I can pull everything inside the tensor power, uh, L equals one to N. Um, okay, yes, I have just two more lines to go. So, well, I'll still have one over the square root of two. I've also pulled apart all of these uh, square root of two factors, n of them inside the, the power. So I have sum over only one of these uh, k's, k sub l, um, and I have e to the two pi i, uh, same factor as before, k l two to the minus l, k l. Now, but this is even simpler because, uh, well, we have a summation, but it's a summation over two terms. So why not actually write the two terms? So that's the last uh, step in this development is to um, cleverly, um, I don't know if I really need a bracket. I don't, I won't put a bracket there, uh, but I will put one here. So I have zero. Uh, so that is to say this, when k sub l is zero, this exponential factor, complex exponential is just one. And otherwise it's something e to the two pi i. Well, it's whatever it is when KL is um, two to the minus L when uh, K sub L is one and there it is. So, so there's a nice simple thing. We're just uh, turning um, our uh, state J. Notice I did this just for a basis state, right? And now I can, I can uh, say that the whole transformation is involves superpositions of these. But I start with a basis state and all I've got are these superpositions of zero plus one with some niggling phases. Um, now, uh, and this is very similar to what happens in the Simon algorithm, except these phases are sort of simpler. These by these, I mean the ones that are right here. And uh, this, I do wanna manipulate a little bit further. Um, let me see. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I have one more, I have a little more space here. So I'll just say, one thing, and I just have to uh, feature what one does. There's this uh, object here, this uh, J uh, times two to the minus L, and that's exactly what we're, we're gonna use this uh, or reasoning because uh, J is an integer with the 
decimal point or the binary point, whatever you want to call it, at the very, very end of the number. And uh, this two to the minus L will pull it into the, in general, into the middle of that number. So J times two to the minus L, you will write as J one times J two times, not times, sorry, times is absolutely wrong. Next to, you know, these are just bit values. So this is like, like uh, well, maybe I'll uh, emphasize it in a moment, but uh, since I said the wrong thing, I have to make sure that I don't say it wrong uh, again. But uh, so first bit J1, second bit J2, and then somewhere along the line, JN minus L, and then the decimal point. And then we have a remaining fractional part, JN, uh, whoops, J, uh, that was supposed to be a, um, an N there. Um, back to, whoops, that's the wrong color. Wow. N minus L minus one, and then all the way down to J sub N. So remember, this is uh, is just standing in for something like you know one one zero one zero one etc. And then finally a decimal place, and then zero 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 one 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 zero one etc. Um, so some funny you know decimal number, but in binary. <clears throat> uh, now the um, because this number is appearing in an exponential. Um, we will actually just lop off, uh, we will just lop off the uh, integer part because e to the two pi i integer is one. So the only thing that will survive in fact is the fractional part. Um, okay, now with that, I will, um, so keep your memory live here because uh, I'm now gonna rewrite what this is with that further insight. And then we're all ready to do gates. We're basically ready to come back to architecture after this interlude. Um, so uh, here we are. So, um, uh, right. So I note that that finally gives me. So the uh, under the QFT, this becomes um, the following tensor factors written out very explicitly. So zero plus e to the two pi i. And the first one turns out to be zero point jn, where the has been shifted over, you know, all the way to the almost the last bit times one over the square root of two. Uh, tensor product in the usual sense. Um, uh, let's just do one more factor, zero plus e to the two pi i. This is where the thing has been shifted over two positions or, or uh, you know, just one sh too short of the last uh, bits of the number. <clears throat> okay, uh, times dot, 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 uh, O times dot, 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 tensor product dot, dot, dot. Now this is interesting in the sense that uh, this is not an entangled state. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a product state and it has sort of, However, it has sort of um, classical correlations between the bits. Now to explain that or to state that now I can say, uh, uh, you know, it became by inspection, one could write a circuit for this. So let me just sort of do the inspection. So uh, quantum circuit uh, bits, J1, J2, J3, J4, et cetera, uh, quantum bits. Um, what gets you uh, almost the right thing is to um, do a Hadamard transformation. Because what, what is a Hadamard transformation? It's nothing but, uh, well, let's say, as what's the state here? This is of course not the full circuit, but uh, Hadamard gives you just zero plus one. Well, zero plus one or zero minus one, depending on whether J1 was a zero or one, but the way you write that is to say that the state there is e to the two pi i uh, zero point j one with our notation one over square root of two. Um, so, and that's uh, part of what's needed. What you finally need here, and you know, to go all the way to the end of this circuit, uh, should be something more like this: zero plus e to the two pi i. I didn't leave myself enough space here. Uh, zero point, 
uh, J1, J2, J3, up to Jn, that's one of these tensor factors up here was that, actually the last one. So in fact, you're also instructed that you have to uh, reverse the order, reverse your interpretation of these bits, uh, qubits, once you've uh, gone through this process. This is times one, by the way, and one over the square root of two. But I haven't, I've gotten the first of these factors uh, by just a simple Hadamard, there it is. And the other ones all uh, are information about the other bits, about bit J2, bit J3, et cetera. And uh, it's only in the phase. So you've got the amplitude right, that is the one over square root of two is right. And so all the subsequent um, gates are, well, we write them this way, but um, it's important to know there's a variety of ways of writing this. This is a two qubit phase gate, two qubit, qubit phase gate. And uh, the one it actually is, is this. Uh, it's uh, you know, a smaller phase by a half compared with the, um, compared with the Hadamard. And it's a two qubit thing. It depends upon J2. And it turns out to be this, e to the two pi i over four. Um, so that's a C phase gate, except it's not a minus one C phase gate. It's a e to the two pi i over four C phase gate. And now I think I'll just jump, uh, since this is indeed an advanced school and I'm not going to, uh, if I did, if I'm doing this in a actual, uh, you know, course lecture, I actually spend a little longer uh, making sure you see why the pattern is like this. That is that uh, it's just a succession of phase gates where, uh, forgive me, I'm going to now uh, quickly annotate this. So when I change this to, uh, to I guess, K, this factor becomes uh, e to the two pi i over two to the k. So when you slice the angles by succession, successive halves. Um, and so uh, you do that for the first bit. And then the second bit, uh, similarly, that is um, uh, the, oops, the second bit, um, you also do a Hadamard. And then it gets uh, it participates in these R gates with uh, the other ones downstream. So dot dot dot. So this is uh, Coppersmith's derivation. He recognized that this meant if you just count the number of gates that are involved here, um, we go down to j to the j sub little n that the number of gates is order n squared. Uh, but actually, even that is not, uh, he immediately saw that he can improve upon that because if K is uh, big enough, uh, or once K gets to be like 20 or something, and you say, I want a, an angle of two to the minus 20. And they say, well, that's really small. So he said, well, forget about it. And uh, beyond two, R20, just don't do it. Or you figure out what your accuracy needed and only do it to that extent. So. The uh, very good approximate gates uh, scheme is order, you know, 20 n. So it's actually linear in n. Uh, so QFT is indeed very efficient in uh, in gate execution. Um, okay, so that's 1994. Actually, if you go forward 10 more years, you find people who figure out ways of parallelizing this to only log depth, but still the same number or or not smaller numbers of gates, but even shorter in time. Um, but I'm not gonna, of course, go into the embellishments of that. Uh, but the key insights of this, and I think I'll, I'll proceed another five or 10 minutes and then uh, come to a stop because now I'm gonna set up the rest of my lecture. Um, so have hopefully gotten you really, really ready for uh, an in-depth dive into the whole rest of this story, uh, which, I mean, this part takes a short time. This part takes definitely more talking and what you will hear tomorrow, I, I would say. And then there's a post-processing, which is also very subtle and amazing uh, and it's incredibly insightful. Uh, Feynman would have been super impressed by the post-processing of this uh, algorithm. Um, and also completely baffled by the thought that you could do, you can actually two, what does it mean you can do two qubit gates? I mean, I've heard of S matrices, but how do you shoot electrons at each other to get them to do R sub N scattering matrices? And, uh, uh, but well, you know, he, 
he set it up in the sense that he said, you have to start doing engineering with atoms. And uh, that's what it amounts to, or some small things, or things that at the quantum uh, level, at the, uh, the least level of action uh, in, in his language also. Okay, so we're moving on here. Um, the rest is pretty much conventional PowerPoint, but I never put my Apple Pencil away, so it still will, will uh, uh, graffito various uh, slides in all probability. Um, okay, so let's, uh, so let's acknowledge that the business of doing sure, of doing exciting factoring is to have lots of qubits uh, because you, well, you heard yesterday in the introduction that uh, IBM talks about making uh, machines with millions of qubits. And uh, that's actually because uh, in our best current understanding, RSA um, uh, 129 would take millions of a quantum computer with millions of qubits to do this. Uh, sorry, I'm backing up here to uh, come back. Oops. Uh, stop it. Okay, that was not not what I wanted. Uh, keep it, of course. And um, so this is even uh, showing you the uh, iPad tool that I'm using here. But we're we're back to our presentation anyway. Just to say that. Uh, this machine apparently takes uh, millions uh, or some smallish number of millions of qubits. That's progress, actually. Ten years ago, we thought it took like hundreds of millions. So there have been actually quite improvements in architectural ideas uh, that have brought it down to only millions of qubits. Um, but uh, but the, we have only the choreographed operations of these two qubit uh, gates, you know, innumerable two qubit gates done uh, sequentially or done maybe in parallel, and actually that's important, but uh, done in computer style, you know, according to clocking and, uh, uh, you know, according to external instruction, in according to a loaded program. Um, all right, let me jump back right into this because, uh, and uh, maybe this will end my first half or, uh, well, a bit more than half perhaps. Um, so this is to get into the question, well, what do you use for qubits? And this is uh, slightly fanciful, but slightly uh, realistic as well. Um, that is um, because I, I built it upon, uh, I built it upon the fact that these all involve uh, bit realizations as well. Um, so each of the things uh, shown in my little cartoon are uh, at first just things that can represent a binary variable, zero and one. So a uh, cat can be alive, uh, but, or a cat can be dead, you know, a binary variable. A, uh, a ball can be sitting in uh, a left-hand metastable well or a right-hand metastable well, uh, zero and one. Uh, light, I say the word photons, but uh, light can have polarization horizontal or vertical. Um, a magnet can point up or down. Um, so when those are, you recognize that, you know, many of them are indeed the basis of, uh, of bits as we know them uh, today. Uh, I mean, I point to this one. This is the one that, uh, you know, stores uh, untold billions of bits in uh, cell phones, let's say, because if you look inside your uh, NAND flash or something or NOR flash, whatever it is these days, and you look at the floating gate, you see that yes, well, now it's not a ball that hops on or off of the floating gate, but it's like 10,000 electrons, that lump of charge that uh, is either definitely on the, uh, the floating gate of your NAND flash, or it's definitely off the gate of the NAND flash. Well, it's not on something else definitely, it's just elsewhere in the environment. But um, so I say that's a very real bit. Uh, and the number is like 10,000 or something. And so it's not quite a qubit, but it's not super far away from it either. And of course, uh, light, it's various you know, uh, degrees of freedom of light we use to communicate a lot. And uh, 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 the, we used to always store bits in uh, hard drives. We don't do that so much anymore, but then magnetic domains. And so all of these had to be, well, we don't use our cats very much for bits. Um, uh, but we use them in, in show, in stories though. Uh, um, 
Okay, so each, each of these can be promoted to being a qubit, or I would say demoted in the sense that we have to follow Feynman's advice and to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. Because 10,000 electrons is too many degrees of freedom, uh, uh, mainly because, uh, well, what because? It has to do with the nature of the energy spectrum of a system with 10,000 electrons, that it's too dense, there are too many individual quantum states. And also it's a matter of to what degree it couples to other degrees of freedom in the environment. And now I'm not going to give a whole lecture about decoherence, but, um, but of course, you know that to make qubits, you have to sit somewhere on a block sphere. You know, To do our quantum Fourier transform, we had to rotate our vector from here to there, uh, perhaps. Actually, that's not, uh, it's more accurate to say it gets rotated around an axis that's halfway between the x-axis and the z-axis. Uh, let's uh, I wasn't thinking about doing this, but why not? Um, you know, if you think of uh, what is a Hadamard transformation, it's a rotation by pi around that axis, that sort of uh, 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 angled axis, 45 degree angled axis, but that will rotate zero around to uh, zero plus one over two, one of the building blocks of our QFT. Um, and, uh, but to have that, I mean, can, can we have that for these objects? And uh, you know, here's a uh, piece of art that I clipped out of a paper. So people, of course, write down that you can make superpositions of cats, but that's all wrong, no matter what uh, Schrodinger said. But uh, Schrodinger would have definitely acknowledged that this is an incomplete or incorrect description of the state because the environment, at least the environment inside the box containing the cat, uh, also is involved. Uh, when the cat dies, the, all sorts of other degrees of freedom inside the box get changed, and that's missing in this state. So you need a cat here and here to say all the other things that happen uh, when the cat dies. So this is not true, and you can't make a, a qubit out of a cat for sure. Uh, if you uh, do a flash memory with one electron, then you for sure can uh, make superpositions, and the physical phenomenon that we refer to is quantum tunneling. Uh, to go from one metastable well to another. And I'll give you an explicit example of that after the break. And, uh, and if our magnet consists of one elementary particle, then it's not even so special. <clears throat> the north and south, you know, the up and down are not even very special. That is that for the uh, spin of an electron, the, uh, you know, the state vector pointing in any direction whatsoever is, uh, is a, uh, can be as absolutely valid as uh, as any other. You know, if I uh, usually say, oh, it's important that it has spin up and spin down, but that's with re reference to some magnetic field direction. But the magnetic field direction can be anything. So, uh, so, so any state on the block sphere is equally good, and one has to account for that in discussing decoherence of things like electrons. Uh, qubits. Usually you indeed break the symmetry externally by putting on a magnetic field. Um, okay, so that's, I'm going to indeed start getting into um, other material. <clears throat> uh, do we, uh, do we break briefly? Um, I will uh, at least pick up my, my teacup. Yeah, we're about halfway through. I think it's a good time for a break. Um, <clears throat> of course, I haven't quote covered very much, but uh, uh, well, we have vast, uh, vast uh, pieces of information to be told about, uh, about Shore, uh, but this gets us into uh, some parts of that. And of course, I haven't told my architectural, my tool story very much at all yet. So are there indeed um, questions or thoughts? Uh, I can look at my Q&A myself. Uh, uh, I don't think we have any in the, in the Q&A yet, but uh, sure. um, maybe I can start it off. Um, can you use the quantum Fourier transform algorithm you showed to speed up the calculation of Fourier transforms, like normal Fourier transforms, or is it? Uh... Um, no, I would say not. Uh, uh, this was always, uh, you know, a potential. Uh, well, I wouldn't say confusion, but it just you have to understand it works in a different domain. That is, that it is indeed. Um, let's go back to this. Uh, maybe it's here. Say, well, there's a. Fourier transform in action, and that's taking the coefficients, uh, uh, precisely the numbers that I'm supposed to Fourier transform classically, and turning them into the numbers that I want classically for the Fourier transform. The trouble is they're state coefficients, so they're not uh, something that are, are sitting there in front of you. You have to make measurements of the quantum state, and you can only learn little 
bits and pieces of this. And once you account for that, then this is not actually a good way to, uh, to do a classical fast Fourier transform. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so I don't see any uh, questions in the Q&A. People are encouraged to ask, but... Um... No, I'm perfectly happy to uh, roll right on because uh, uh, by the end there, well, there are vast other things to ask questions about. And, uh, uh, but I promise that I will be finished. Let's see, it's now 52 after the hour and I'm shooting to be finished in uh, uh, well less than an hour. Uh, so in 45 minutes or so, I should be wrapped up easily. Um, so uh, I'll make that as a definite target. Maybe I'll even say I'm, I'll shoot for 35 after the hour and then we'll have a good long time for discussion and also a tea break or coffee break uh, after that, okay? Um, okay, so I decided to feature first the qubit that is most directly related to, uh, well, this picture that, uh, and that was uh, itself quite a technological adventure that, um, uh, now, I mean, as I say today, and maybe for the last 10 years, we've had, uh, it's been commonplace to have uh, flash cells which manipulate 10,000 electrons at a time. That, that's an already an incredible you know, reduction. I mean, it's most of the way towards uh, the bottom as, uh, as Feynman described it. You know, his, in his time, you would have had to have, you had a number something close to Avogadro's number uh, to store a bit. So the, uh, in, in, there's been, where it was incredible, you know, reduction, but still to go from 10,000 to one is uh, some work. And, um, and as of 20 years ago, that had not been done, but uh, with the impetus of qubits of saying, look, we, you know, we need a program to actually realize qubits. Um, uh, there were efforts underway. Now, at that time, there were already microstructures of the form kind of shown here, which are very nice uh, pieces of semiconductor physics, where you have, uh, you know, layers of superconduct of sorry of semiconductors of semiconductor layers that um, in which uh, electrons can flow, and it was al already understood in the 1990s that you could. Uh, apply voltages, you know, put electrodes, you know, there's various electrodes here, and you could apply voltages to those electrodes and man manipulate those electron flows and pinch them off. And uh, also to pinch off whole regions so that you would indeed have a puddle of electrons in, uh, in some region like this. <clears throat> and uh, according to the technology of the 90s, uh, you could have a number of electrons um, of you know maybe a hundred or something, so it was definitely already well below this uh, technological, uh, you know, iPhone technology uh, uh, scale that we have today. But def also not really quantum, uh, but it was important. Uh, we knew, or you know, uh, we at IBM, in fact, participated in the science of this at that time, that you began to see uh, effects like the uh, Millikan experiment, which, which by which I mean that you could detect. When this number is not not the number I was not the capital N of before, where this number would jump from n to n minus one, you could see it, like you see it in a, in an oil drop experiment, and so that was a sign that you maybe had a chance of manipulating electrons at the single electron level. You could at least increment uh, and decrement the number of electrons in that way. Uh, but after some years of hard pushing, you know another. 10 years of research, uh, the bottom was reached in this, uh, in this field. Uh, you know, the, uh, it was indeed possible in this experiment uh, uh, in 2004 to shrink the number of electrons in these little uh, pockets to exactly one. And uh, when you say, how do you know that? And you know it because you can in fact do this jumping in an extremely controlled way. This, this is uh, showing the voltages applied to the various electrodes. And uh, if you tuned it upright, you could have it where you change V6, here's V6 a little bit, and you see jump, and you know you've added one electron, and you can infer that it's an added electron here. So you've gotten to a state where there's two and one. Now, you don't know that unless you can back out, so you go to zero one by a similar jump and you, with ma manipulating V2, V2's here, you go to zero zero. And uh, the big clue or the thing that tells you 
that where you are is then you're in a vast wasteland. That is, you go, um, uh, you know, you go a, a very, very far in this scale by, uh, th this is a millivolt scale. You go by a whole volt and you don't see any more jumps. And so that infer, or that implies that you've co totally emptied the system of electrons. And then you just go back and go jump, jump, and then you're back to one, one. So, um, now I'm not gonna proceed so much with this that there was indeed a fruitful time when it was thought, well, here's the qubit. Um, and oh, I should use a different color. I'm doing red on red. Uh, maybe this is the qubit because this is the, this pair, this one comma zero and zero comma one is exactly what I featured uh, here, uh, right here. And um, so that is a qubit and you can document it as qubit. Unfortunately, it's a rather noisy qubit. And uh, it was found that, uh, yes, you can see effects of coherent quantum tunneling, but the coherence time, so the T2 is of order one nanosecond and uh, pretty hard to improve, it turned out. So, um, but that was not the primary qubit that we were focusing on at that time. We were focusing on a qubit that could be made uh, in this region where there's two electrons, and uh, then you use the spin states. So you actually use magnetic states of electrons to call those two qubits. Um, and uh, that has led to continued development. And I won't follow that story so much, but it still has its uh, devotees and people are still hoping to scale up. But uh, the fact is that people have not gotten beyond two qubit uh, uh, devices so far. <clears throat> um, not for totally fundamental reasons, but it seems that the, the microfabrication is very difficult. And uh, that's enough to make uh, a, a project take 10 years. And so, uh, but you know, it's still a very lively and active field and people are getting very nice PhDs still in working in this subject. And I think there are still hopes for it. It has very nice features and interfaces to uh, to light, but I won't pursue that much further. I will, I will tell you more uh, stories about uh, where we're going with the superconducting side. Uh, recognizing you've already heard a chunk of this from uh, Andreas Walroff, but uh, perhaps I have a somewhat broader uh, perspective on this, you know, looking, uh, pulling back a little bit from uh, what you know from him or what you, I'm sure you've been learning about otherwise. So uh, let me get into this that, um, um, so at around the same time, uh, well, I, indeed, all of this was kicked off by Shor's algorithm, I would say, that is that uh, this was all completely just mathematics and people playing around up to that time. And then from that point onward, uh, physicists immediately jumped in and said, can I do this? And uh, so um, it was actually, a bit, in a sense, a slower start to, uh, to pursue these objects, although they were known from about, uh, I think the uh, year 1985 was actually an important year in the development of this in physics laboratories, that it was understood that you could make electric circuits with quantized energy levels uh, with no coherence. So it was really uh, very poor looking from the point of view of, of actually making a, a qubit. That is that you, yes, there is apparently a block sphere uh, there was also apparently, as of that year, um, uh, very little uh, chance of there being any uh, isolation from the environment. Um, so, but still, um, uh, but that's turned out to be not true. That has uh, been the, uh, and why? Well, I don't know. It's the people in that field say it's because of the tremendous flexibility of the engineerability of this phenomenon. And I think there's a lot to, to be said for that point of view. And it's not because, of course, it's at the atomic scale. This is about the smallest thing you ever see in a, in a superconducting processor. Um, there is a crucial step which involves uh, producing the, super, the Cooper pair tunneling phenomenon that gives you this circuit element, the Josephson junction circuit element. And that requires this moderately small, um, you might say nanotechnology, but it's like 30 year old nanotechnology. It was the same as was used in the papers in 1985. Uh, these papers were by uh, Devore, uh, Martinez and uh, Clark. 
So still familiar names in the field. In fact, Martinez was a PhD student when he, when he did this first work. And uh, they already learned how to do this shadow evaporation. And you see this uh, pretty crummy looking uh, aluminum. And if you slice it open and you look at the, uh, the oxide between the two pieces of aluminum, it's also very crummy looking. But still, uh, nothing really has been needed uh, to, uh, to be improved on that. I'll say by contrast, uh, uh, well, this is a, a bit of an aside. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you know that people are also pursuing the Majorana qubit. Majorana qubits also involve similar materials, but uh, combined with other materials. Uh, but there the uh, understanding is there is a super high need per for perfection. So uh, this level of uh, quote perfection, or in fact imperfection of, uh, of these interfaces, nowhere near atomically controlled, um, are total non-starter from the point of view of making Majorana qubits. So, and that's been the tragedy of Majorana qubits, at least so far, that uh, they are even worse than spin qubits when it, in being blocked by the, uh, you know, the inability to be, to achieve what we platonically think should be a Majorana qubit. Whereas here we don't need Plato that in fact, uh, we can live with uh, some very uh, messy stuff and, uh, it's actually something about, like you might say, the topology of superconductivity that makes this very robust, uh, that it survives a lot of dirt. Um, there was, in fact, uh, this actually harkens back to what is called Anderson's theorem, which is a sort of theorem in the sense of solid state physics, which is to say there's no such thing as an, there's not actually any mathematical theorem. It's just a sort of idea of Philip Anderson that, uh, well, backed up by some scribbles, by some mathematical scribbles involving the BCS theory that um, most forms of dirt, as long as it doesn't involve magnets, is uh, not at all um, deleterious to superconductivity. And so that's uh, very much in action. So somehow Anderson's theorem has been the, the basis of the tremendous development of superconducting uh, qubits. All right, so I, I'm sure you know about this already, but this is just to say that uh, the key thing about, uh, or, or the observations is that these superconducting circuits involve uh, first very ordinary elements like uh, capacitors and also uh, inductors, not shown here, but you know, with, oh no, shown here. Uh, but with capacitors and induct inductors alone, you can make very low loss circuits because of superconductivity, but you can only make harmonic oscillators uh, but with the Josephson junction, which functions as a sort of nonlinear inductor, you can make other kinds of circuits with sort of atomic-like spectra. And then you can, uh, because of the, uh, you know, the capabilities of spectroscopy, you can single out the lowest lying energy levels and use them as the qubit. So that was not anticipated in my little sketch. And in a sense, it's less classical. There's not like, you can't say this works because there's a classical analog um, it's, it's indeed more like the atomic qubits, which I'm not going to talk about, which have no direct uh, analog uh, in this. If there was a time, there are superconducting circuits that realize such double well structures. They're called the flux qubit, uh, but they're not actually the best qubit. So uh, they're not the lowest noise qubit. So we don't really use them these days. Um, Okay, now we don't need to do much about this, but uh, of course, to going to the present, we have incredible, apparently, machines. And um, I, I guess that uh, uh, you've already had these decoded for you, but I wanna make a few points here that, oops, that um, we still have a long way to go. I mean, this, uh, but still IBM has uh, these 50 qubit devices and Andreas Walroff is working hard on 17 qubits and uh, has many things to say about seven qubit devices. I'll show sort of related ones uh, shortly to make a few points. Um, uh, I guess a point to be made here is that, uh, well, I've noticed that including on the German television last night, there was a story about quantum computers because IBM is selling one of these gizmos to uh, the German government or to Fraunhofer. Now, sorry, I'm jumping into sociology here. But sure enough, they showed a picture of one of these gizmos. And it's all sort of become iconic that uh, as far as the public is concerned, you know, watching the five o'clock news in Germany, this is a quantum computer. And you say, what's the heck's quantum about it? And uh, 
uh, and the answer is hardly anything, uh, that it's a piece of infrastructure from physics. Uh, it does make things super cold. So from everything from here below is, uh, you know, 20 millikelvin, which is a pretty remarkable piece of technology, but it's not quantum. Uh, well, okay, it's, it does involve the quantum properties of helium isotopes, right? But uh, okay, that's a very indirectly quantum. It's not quantum computing. And uh, e but even in this uh, cold space, I mean, this all enclosed in cans once, uh, once, uh, uh, once you operate. Actually, the German uh, television audience did get, get a chance to see somebody uh, pretending to put a can onto the bottom of this. So at least they got a little bit more exposure to what's what are the next steps? You don't just you know, admire this in the open air and it quantum computes, uh, um, has to be sealed up. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the qubits are all here. I, I don't know if you can see where I'm gesturing here, but they're just in a very tiny space. They are indeed all on one little chip and they're uh, down at the bottom of this can. Uh, the can is there to prevent magnetic fields from getting to this device because uh, one of the bad stuff, bad facts about uh, superconductors, about these devices, is they are very, very sensitive to magnetic fields. They make very good magnetometers, but that also means that you must absolutely exclude fields from, you know, the Earth's field is like a gigantic, uh, you know, huge, unbelievably high magnetic field from the point of view of Josephson tunneling. So you have to exclude it by several orders of magnitude. And that's the point of the, many of the cans are doing that. Uh, Sorry, I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, I may be repeating some of what you heard yesterday, but uh, sometimes very important knowledge is worth uh, repeating. But I wanted to get to some thoughts about, uh, you know, where things are with this. And this is an example of just one of the generations of IBM's chips, you know, what's actually at the bottom of these cans. And um, of course, they're, they moved on to 50 and or so. <clears throat> But at least they gave a lot of scientific information about this particular chip. Uh, about the more advanced chips, there's now a bit of a gray wall. You don't get to learn as much about any details of what they're doing scientifically. So I stay with this somewhat earlier uh, generation. So, um, well, of course the news is, but I'm sure you all know this. Yes, indeed, we've re jumped to the point where you could do things on 16 qubits. Uh, on, uh, you know, really draw and in the IBM Q tool, you can indeed, you know, literally draw a circuit and do a QFT, QFT if you want and discover that the qubits are still a little too noisy to do a full 16 qubit QFT, but you, I mean, you can try it anyway. Um, um, <clears throat> as a piece of chip technology, it's very trivial. That is, there's nothing very small about it. You can all see it uh, with your eye if you look uh, closely. So it's, the only thing you can see is that there are Josephson junctions and they're deep in the qubits. Now the 16 qubits, I think I see in, yeah, on the next slide, I say, where, where physically are the qubits? And they are actually there. The Josephson junctions are more or less in the middle of these, um, of these uh, ellipses. And then as, as with uh, the ETH work, but definitely different in detail, um, there are many, many uh, couplers. And uh, so, uh, the couplers you can say are there because the the qubits are you might say fundamentally coupled by photons, uh, but these are photons in the microwave frequency range, and the way a photon gets from let's see what yeah sorry um, the way a photon gets from this uh, qubit to that qubit is via this uh, transmission line uh, which is on the chip. But it doesn't go straight there. It uh, it meanders around. It goes this way and that, and then it finally gets there. Uh, this meandering is of no significance, particularly. It's just there for uh, sort of miniaturization. The uh, photon, so to speak, can easily turn the corners. Or uh, more scientifically, this is functioning still as a one-dimensional waveguide. Um, um, now I say photons, but in fact, it's only virtual photons. Uh, typically that you use uh, virtual processes involving this resonator, uh, this intervening resonator to couple qubits. And, uh, but you can accomplish phase gates, you can accomplish other entangling gates uh, with you know, pretty good precision. I, I think that in the latest work of IBM, they're typically above 99% fidelity of the entangling operations. Um, I'll maybe near the very end, I'll make some comments on that, but it'll only be a sort of 
uh, uh, lead into uh, the lecture you get, I believe, tomorrow about uh, quantum error correction, because that's what we see as uh, necessary to, to do, sure. <clears throat> But to do you know moderate scale things, uh, this is not too bad. Uh, but you would like another decimal place of fidelity to do, you know, quite a bit more serious things. So, and I think maybe at the time this chip was uh, extant, this was not quite as good. That is, uh, a couple of years ago, this was ninety five or ninety seven percent. So enough to see something, but um, you know, it means that in in the course of one entangling gate operation the environment also gets entangled at the level of a few percent with the state, which is not at all what you want. The ideal of quantum computing or the necessity of quantum computing is that the environment has to be kept out, that you, the dynamics is, uh, remains in the restricted degrees of freedom that are defined by the qubits. And that's not uh, what physics likes, or physics, the physics does not uh, do that very naturally. So. Uh, one has to do a lot of uh, choosing and engineering to make it uh, possible. Um, okay, so we have these coupling resonators. There's also a coupler, I won't follow the meanders, but there are couplers that go to here also. So you form a ladder of couplers. And then there are all these other uh, resonators and couplers that go out to the outside. And that has to do with the technicalities of how you actually deliver control signals to the qubit and how you read out uh, the state of the qubit when you, uh, you know, when you choose to, when, when you wish to. Uh, you, you know, you should usually not be measuring the qubits. That, of course, would spoil the entangled uh, quantum states. Um, now, a few more things that sort of, uh, I'm skating between sort of uh, the electrical engineering point of view of this and the physics view. Um, but I'll mention uh, some trouble that IBM exposed. I mean, there there's this deficit, this fidelity deficit, and it was very important to form a budget for that. You know, this much of it is due to, you know, process X, and this is much of it is due to process Y, and that's been very difficult, painstaking work um, that, uh, I mean, typically you deal with all the easy stuff, and so there's this host of, or several roughly equivalent things that uh, all are sitting there, and you can't just by dealing with one of them uh, cure all the problems. Uh, but one that was uh, sort of interesting is that <clears throat> there was clear evidence that there was still effective couplings, I mean, really quantum mechanical couplings between qubits that were not supposed to be coupled at all. So, you know, we draw circuits, but uh, this, the entangling circuits were only allowed in the uh, in the uh, you know, running of the circuit to operate between, let me temporarily give these numbers, one, two, three, four. You know, from the point of view of qubit one, it's coupled, it can entangle uh, on demand you know, by computer instruction with qubit two, it can entangle with qubit three, it can entangle with qubit four, that's it. Uh, other couplers are not present and are not supposed to be there. You know, you draw the circuit, you never draw a gate between one and I don't know what number this was going to be, you know, 18, not 18, but some, some farther off number. Um, but nevertheless, they did uh, very painstaking studies of this and they found that there is apparently some entangling interaction between these. Now it's at a small level. Now I haven't talked, you know, megahertz, gigahertz, whatever, terahertz, but uh, this is a kind of largish number. It's not, it's sort of not the biggest number in the business, but um, if you talk spectroscopy, it's a clearly distinguishable number. It involves many languages of number. So I'll, I'll use this as an excuse to tell you about a little research that um, we're in uh, on this subject. And we've gone, had taken some nice first steps, but still have many applications to develop along these lines. Um, so uh, first, uh, so now I'm back, I'm up to the minute, so to speak, or this involves a paper that we published um, last year, two years ago now, uh, pre, pre, a bit pre-corona, let's put it that way. I, last year and a half has been a bit of uh, like a time warp, I guess. Um, so this is first to set some language that we say that uh, qubits uh, tend, to, if you view them as spins, well, also I can just say as viewing them as qubits, they have some, well, I, I like to say spin-spin interaction because I like to say they have an XY interaction. 
but this is indeed using the sort of quantum info type language for that. These are the Pauli matrices of spins i and j, of qubits i and j. And uh, we have, our understanding says that typically both, both the intentional couplings and the unintentional couplings, you know, both the ones that are direct, this is a little, well, this is the smaller chip where uh, there are intended direct couplings between these guys, but not direct, no coupling and uh, nothing is supposed to go between these two qubits. Uh, but between all of them, there is apparently some quantum mechanical coupling. And um, uh, up to this work, there was no clear way of modeling it and uh, of predicting how big they would be. Um, and this uh, provided for me a kind of Rosetta stone that uh, uh, it says, uh, you know, what does an engineer do if he looks at this chip or he says, this is some piece of microwave uh, 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 technology. Um, and uh, he knows, I mean, if he's a microwave analog circuit designer, he should characterize the electromagnetic interference and he has tools for doing so. You know, you want to uh, characterize various sort of uh, electromagnetic properties of this. And one of them is a so-called transimpedance. And transimpedance, a totally classical concept. It says apply um, uh, apply some currents, test currents to some part of the circuit here, circuit part to J of the circuit, like uh, labeled four, and see how big the voltages are, the AC voltages are that appear at qubit or, or at port one, he would say port, because um, he doesn't know about Josephson tunneling. And in fact, the instruction for him is to leave the Josephson tunneling out, to leave that as an open circuit for the purpose of of um, characterizing or simulating modeling, calculating these trans impedances. And what we say on the basis of a definitely quantum mechanical derivation uh, involves a schrieffer wolf transformation and various fancy things, that we have a translation between what the engineer can tell you about this chip, because he can characterize the trans impedance as a function of frequency, and with a few simple parameters uh, that, well, you have to get from knowing a few elementary things about Josephson junctions, like their effective inductance, this will tell you uh, how big this quantum coupling is, <clears throat> including the unintended ones. And the, uh, the engineer can run this and confirm that the couplings are nice and big, what they're supposed to be for the ones where you do have entanglement or you do want entangling gates which you further activate with microwave, uh, external microwave tones. Um, but he can also see there are non-zero cross impedances, you know, really across the chip, you know, across this uh, third neighbor dire uh, uh, direction. And we characterized, um, so this sketch gives a few ideas. One is that the, the work of the engineer involves making, you know, actual finite element uh, meshes. So you see the, uh, the triangulation of this uh, device. Uh, you have to also worry about the package that it sits in and you know, what conductors are above, what conductors are below. And you go ahead and model it. And then with the painstaking, so model, and uh, with the painstaking, you know, somewhat indirect, but really experimental characterizations that IBM has, they can back out values of these Js for many uh, uh, distant couplers, distant couplings. And there are a lot of them in this a few megahertz range. And this shows the correlation between uh, theory and experiment. And well, it's not perfect, but it's definitely predictive. And it's uh, the first time that we've had a tool like this for really uh, predictively uh, characterizing these devices. And the message is you really have to talk to your engineers. You have to be an engineer or think like an engineer to realize that you should uh, do modeling at this level. I mean, you forget Schrodinger's equation. You remember Maxwell, though, and uh, uh, you remember Maxwell's equations, that is, and you, uh, you solve them seriously, and they're not easy to solve. In fact, the convergence of such things is a pain and is not, is not at all easy for the entire chip. Um, uh, but that's, you know, further challenge for, you know, further uh, tweaking up these uh, devices. So there's one um, sort of message that I wanted to convey to you and bring, you know, give you some flavor of some of the current research. Uh, and uh, we've taken a first step in this direction, but I believe, I mean, I'm intending to participate more 
you know, from the point of view, I, you know, I'm the physicist, you might say, but uh, actually all of us are physicists uh, who are in this, uh, in this uh, collaboration. But uh, I think the further work uh, needs, um, you know, actually more serious engineers who like really know how to converge these uh, microwave propagation calculations. Okay, so let me go on to touch on a few other things. Now, I say I'm going to talk about noise uh, uh, and fault tolerance, but I mostly leave that to my colleague uh, tomorrow, I believe. But um, I want to put this, I want to say if enough words about this that it motivates a few further thoughts about architectures and where we are going. You know, how do we get from 16 qubits to 5 million qubits? You know, that's uh, what I'd like to state. And um, uh, part of it is that uh, this coupling to the environment definitely has to be small. And this, these numbers that I featured here, where, you know, they're sort of close, but they're not uh, where, quite where they need to be. So, and it remains a bit of a mystery for the field of how we will squeeze out those last few orders of magnitude. Uh, here's a, a bit of an overview. Remember, I, I state this is a timeline about superconducting qubits, and I could have started it. Let's see if I can actually tick it off. I've never done this before. Here's 1990. Here's 1980s, a little bit off the, the page, but here's 1985. And I, as I said, I told you this Martinez et al. paper was here. So the first evidence that there were two level systems or quantized. <clears throat> energy level systems in superconducting circuits was in that year. Um, but the first entry on this chart is here in, in the year uh, 1999. So there was uh, years of research that had nothing to do with qubits, um, but we're still gradually building the knowledge to uh, push the environment away a little bit further, you know, get rid of the resistors. Um, you know, a typical application in this entire timeline would actually have involved a resistor on purpose. So, and that's definitely bad news. Resistors have lots of environmental degrees of freedom and you can get entangled with them. And uh, well, they're like a bath. So you, uh, you definitely do not do coherent quantum things with circuits with resistors. Um, but the Japanese group, uh, Nakamura and company found a way of making them uh, show some coherence. And the first, Coherence time was around one nanosecond, so just barely enough to see, I would say, but um, in 1999. But um, somehow, because of the great flexibility of this subject, and there were many actors ready to jump in, that the very first jump was by two orders of magnitude. This is uh, quantronium. And uh, many groups contributed to further pushing up this coherence time. And uh, so I've stopped this survey here, but the, uh, well, there are a few messages to state here. So the last few brought it up. So by in total, six orders of magnitude. And these were, uh, these are values where definitely these 99% become possible for, for entangling gates, uh, not guaranteed because for example, this crosstalk, this quantum crosstalk that I just mentioned is not a decoherence mechanism. So it's not something you detect by measuring a T2 time of your, of your device. So, uh, but if these coherence uh, effects, these environmental decoherence effects were the only contributor, then you would have passed a sort of threshold for the effective use of, um, of error correction around here. So around uh, the year 2010. So why didn't we very quickly have a million qubit computers? Well because there are lots of other contributors, unfortunately, to bad fidelity. Um, a part of the story, well, one fact about the story is that uh, this has in fact leveled off. So I don't, uh, here's the present on this timeline and uh, the actual further progress on coherence has kind of stalled. Um, and I, uh, in other words, there, there are now reports of experiments that have uh, 500 microsecond coherence times, but that's about it. Um, uh, another important distinction, especially these, many of the early ones were on experiments with only one qubit, uh, but most of the later ones were on things where yes, at least there was one other qubit involved. And um, 
that is indeed the standard now. That was part of the message that uh, I tell here, and I leave this here, even though I, this is a projection I made 10 years ago, and I find that I was too pessimistic. When I say reproducible, I mean, you know, a coherence time that really was present and usable in a multi-qubit structure. And I thought the progress on that would be rather slow, but it's actually been rather faster. That is, uh, that indeed in multi-qubit devices, we also have good coherence, but we have crosstalk and other problems that uh, get in the way of really effectively using error correction so far. <clears throat> Still, that remains a prime hope in this field. And it feels like we've come tantalizingly close. That is from the perspective of someone who worked indeed in this era, um, you know, and I participated in fact in the physics of, of uh, low temperature electronic devices in this era. So this feels like an incredible new world, you know, to be six orders of magnitude up in coherence, but it's still not sort of quite enough to, uh, to achieve the technologies that we really want. Um, this, um, you know, uh, let's see, I show this. This is an example of a current multi-qubit uh, device from the Delft um, uh, group. And, but I'm a little out of order here in the sense that I wanted to say just a few things about codes uh, but again, but now from the sort of hardware and architecture point of view, that um, if you look at how to use um, the topological surface code, <clears throat> a fact about it is that you have um, a lot of uh, sort of waste um, in the sense that it's not one qubit equals one, you know, data carrying qubit. That uh, one feature of it to make these codes work, you have to sacrificially measure some qubits constantly, uh, basically, as, as frequently as you can manage. And the, that's the dark blue ones in this fabric. Uh, so the messages of, uh, you know, one might write the word Kitaev as the discoverer of this uh, co construct that he uh, showed for us, or he and his and uh, others showed that um, basically 2D layouts of, of qubits are a very good idea for error correction, as opposed to 1D layouts. The 1D layouts are not so effective for error correction. And it has to do with topology, and I won't say anything more about it at the moment. Uh, but that if you if you do use 2D layouts, you, have, you will, uh, or in all error correction schemes that we have in mind, you will have to be measuring constantly to diagnose errors on the re remainder of the qubits. So you have uh, the white qubits are the ones that remain. and um, <clears throat> become entangled. Uh, but uh, then there's, again, a big overhead in the sense that uh, for uh, reasonable error rates, and by reasonable, I mean, let's say you were up here and um, no other errors, no crosstalk or uh, other sort of engineering errors were getting in the way, you would still need a whole patch of, of qubits, uh, maybe, uh, you know, a thousand qubits uh, just to represent one logical qubit. So that's a very big overhead. And it explains why the Shore algorithm, if you read it through, only involves a few thousand qubits. So why do we say a few million qubits? And it's because of this redundancy that we foresee for quantum error correction. Um, but as I say, foresee, that is that uh, even you know Google and IBM that's, that have made chips where you could have tried out error correction codes, they're just not high performance enough for that to work effectively. So there's been not much point. They have reported results on repetition codes, on simpler codes, on little fragments of code problems, <clears throat> but no nothing that really illustrates the power of error correcting codes. And that's in my text, which I've already graffitoed here, that um, the promise of error correction is that you take the effective error rate and you get another 14 orders of magnitude. So, um, you get uh, you know, far beyond anything that we expect is reasonable in the physics laboratory. The physicist cannot uh, exclude you know, uh, environmental decoherence by another 14 orders of magnitude. Six orders of magnitude have, have already been uh, miraculous. Uh, so, but, uh, but software promises another four 14 orders of magnitude. But so far, we haven't even seen one of those 14 orders of magnitude. Oh, but now I can say that this is indeed the effort of uh, Di Carlo, but and also in Balrov's group, but um, but <clears throat> where he features explicitly that he has uh, two different sort of species of qubits. They're the A species, which are the ancilla, which are the 
these sacrificial qubits, and then the d qubits, which are the data qubits, and this comprises one plaquette of the of the uh, of the Kitayev code. And when we have the uh, surface seventeen, that'll comprise what is it, five plaquettes or something of the of the Kitayev code, and. Um, and uh, I know that these groups hope to publish on those uh, soon, but they've been technically uh, uh, hellacious to uh, to get them to really work. I'll, I'll uh, now I'll feature a little bit of this uh, hellaciousness uh, in the next section, um, uh, which I'm going to jump mostly to this business of measurement, isolation, amplification, system view. So not much more to say here. Uh, I should say that the um, the idea that there would have to be layouts like this is not such a new idea that uh, that I you can find these sort of uh, wallpaper I design ideas in uh, my paper twelve years ago. Uh, the the reality has not turned out quite exactly this way, and uh, but something similar, you know, qubits and resonators in various patterns are going to be what you see. Um, uh, let me not do those. Okay, now. Um, Here's part of the other news that says that uh, we need the engineers uh, desperately. Um, so this is, whoops, uh, this, why did that happen? Because, uh, okay. Um, this is not so new, uh, but again, it was good because 2012 it was good because it shows a lot of details which are not shown in much recent work as work in, at, uh, at uh, Delft. And this shows one qubit in a, few qubit experiment. But what this features is that the blue box is the quantum stuff. And uh, but the experimentalist has to worry about the entire diagram. And uh, this <clears throat> is a little bit the story of, you know, why does why is there this massive shiny chandelier that everybody uh, on the, all the German television viewers think is a is a quantum computer that uh, a large part of what they see, of course, they see these sections of different temperatures up to room temperature, but they see many, many cables and uh, they see very loopy cables. And uh, there are these things. So there are uh, microwave cables that go in and out uh, uh, because of the uh, very unautonomous nature of the quantum computer. It has to be constantly told what to do, it has to be constantly told this is the time to entangle uh, the following two qubits, and that involves sending just the right kind of signal uh, on this line down, literally uh, down into the cryostat from room temperature uh, into the transmon. <clears throat> and then you want to read out uh, the qubits uh, occasionally, at least half of them, as I just showed in the design that I mentioned. And when you want to do that, you have to send some signals down a different line, and uh, they will uh, go through some complicated hardware, some isolators and circulators, which are very bulky or far bulkier than the, um, than the qubit chip itself. Um, into here, they bounce back again and uh, they uh, go into here, they're amplified, they get bounced back into here, then they go up a different cable, go through an amplification chain. So uh, this involves, uh, so this describes what's going on with uh, most of the physical bulk of what's going on inside this uh, chandelier, this shiny uh, device, most of it's the cables and the amplifiers and the filters and things that comprise this, because this is one channel. This is what you do for one qubit. Think 5 million of these. Um, so that's a, a gigantic number of wires. And uh, IBM seriously thinks it will at least up to 1,000 do it this way. They'll build in thousands of wires uh, you know, from the chip out to the rest of the world. Um, uh, the other problem is uh, each of these are instruments that, and uh, Di Carlo was kind enough to say exactly what instrument or in some cases data card um, was involved. Uh, each of them is, you know, tens of thousands of euros uh, if you just go ahead and buy them. And uh, so that times a million doesn't sound like a very economic proposition. And uh, so I'll give you some quote vision for where that's going, uh, but it's daunting. Uh, 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 so a first step, which has already been taken pretty completely by Google, 
is to uh, take these um, you know, manufacturer instruments, which you put into an equipment rack and um, make them by them, make them themselves. Uh, you know, in other words, make, figure out what functionality is, is uh, needed in that device and make it on one little chip that you, uh, you know, you uh, make out of an, uh, a field programmable gate array, uh, FPGA or something like that. And that is gradually replacing some of these instruments so that the, the instrument rack for the 50, um, 50 qubit experiment, 53 qubit experiment of, of Google is just a few racks and not uh, several rooms full of equipment, which it would have been according to the paradigm of this approach, which is you know, uh, buy boxes from uh, Agilent and Tektronix that will do all this work. Uh, sorry if this doesn't sound very much like quantum physics, but to me it is, that is if, if this stuff is going to work, all this other stuff also has to work. And um, this was made pretty explicit. Uh, okay, this is revealing um, uh, from one of the earlier generation Google experiments, not the 53 qubit one, but the nine qubit device, which they spent a lot of time on. They did, uh, if you go deep into their supplementary material, they went to the trouble of showing you their entire wiring structure. Uh, they did it in a much more abbreviated form than DiCarlo did, but it's evident that they did basically have to replicate uh, all this complexity uh, more or less nine times. Um, there is some, uh, quote, multiplexing that's involved already. You can uh, use the same signal wire for multiple measurements, and that uh, allows a sharing, some sharing of, um, of devices. But uh, this is an example also from deep in their uh, supplement of the actual physical waveforms, well, physical electromagnetic waveforms or electric voltage waveforms that are sent onto their transmission lines. Now, I'm not at all going to decode these 23 uh, channels. Um, as you see, there many of them are kind of repetitive, but not really, you know, that they are actually uh, changing what they do uh, uh, from time to time in order to execute an algorithm. Um, <clears throat> I do know enough to see that the, the long tones mean measurement uh, uh, and the shorter ones generally mean that you're, you're slightly adjusting some magnetic flux that's changing a property of the circuit or you're having a little burst of microwave radiation which is uh, usually energizing some, uh, well, either one or two qubit gate. Um, and I, I believe one could distinguish which ones, but uh, well, we're not going to go to the trouble of diagnosing those, but all that has to work very precisely as a very precise piece of analog hardware um, functioning in a whole system. Now, I have no real solution to this, uh, uh, except that people from spin qubits, remember the double, uh, double uh, well things, uh, say, we're going to get there eventually, and we have some advantages, they say. And uh, one is we can have a way simpler refrigerator. Um, so uh, recall this is uh, this is all happening at a few millikelvin, and that's sort of obligatory for superconductors. I well, I won't say why, but it's been uh, there's quite some recent research that says that the uh, the chip for spin qubits uh, could actually be promoted to the next level of this uh, refrigerator to the like. Uh, uh, two Kelvin uh, stage, oops, two Kelvin stage of this fridge. That would be a great revolution, actually, because uh, basically because uh, heat handling is far easier at those temperatures. Um, it's very hard to make the qubits work reliably there. The environment is far more active at two Kelvin than at 10 uh, millikelvin, milli, milli and uh, that shows itself in the coherence time. So you have to really work to not degrade coherence times by going to these temperatures, but uh, there's some promising uh, results in that direction. Um, now, the other thought is um, a little more speculative, but is connected with that. You already, my, my screen event already jumped to that, but um, the paradigm has been, as I say, to take you know 5 million cables and connect them right onto the chip. Um, that's not quite what happens, but uh, there's, um, it's not so different from that, but there's another paradigm that is sort of coming, 
which is that uh, you will replace these millions of signal lines coming into the refrigerator by like one or two. And because there's only eventually, or finally, there's just some digital information that controls everything. And at the moment controls all these microwave boxes. Um, but the, um, the idea is to somewhere in here, you know, at four Kelvin or something to slip in all the electronics. Uh, all these things that take 10,000 per box, you reduce it to some, uh, you know, a few micron area on a chip. Um, and there's serious research going on. Actually, you have a splendid department at APFL that is doing exactly this and has perfected putting uh, component parts onto chips and proving that they work at four Kelvin. Um, they dissipate like milliwatts, which is no, a no-go. You cannot dil dis dissipate milliwatts uh, at, um, at, uh, at millikelvin temperatures, but you can possibly dissipate milliwatts you know, times many channels uh, at these higher temperatures. Okay, so that's, uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up my lecture. I went a little beyond the time I stated. Oh yeah, uh, well, sorry, I meant to really leave a good chunk for discussion, but um, hopefully this has given you a good to really quote engineering view of where things are. And I think that's where the real developments will be happening in the next few years. So I'll stop there. Um, I know that uh, we're very just close to quote coffee break. I'm of course happy to stay on and do Q and A right until you have your next uh, event. But please also go and fill up your uh, your cups. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for the illuminating lecture, uh, Professor DiVincenzo. And uh, yeah, the floor is open for questions. I see we already have one. So uh, the question is, is there a fundamental limit to the size of superconducting qubits? Could we shrink them further down? Um, the trend has been to uh, blow them up rather than shrink them. And that came from insights of, about the electromagnetics, it turns out uh, that, um, and this, you know, can become part of the engineering understanding, but it's a fairly complicated story that if you have uh, very small um, uh, qubits, it means you have small structures like small capacitors and things like that. Uh, small capacitors means highly concentrated electric fields, so strong electric fields. And unfortunately, strong electric fields, uh, especially AC strong electric fields, tend to shake up the environment. And that does actually bring in some material science, you know, shakes up uh, defects in the environment in two level systems, it makes the dielectrics rather lossy. So the insight was to make, to make really good coherence qubits, it was important to sort of spread them out, make the capacitors kind of big, and the electric fields never have sharp corners and have the electric fields all kind of weak. Um, and so that avoided these, well, really nonlinear effects, but nonlinear uh, loss effects. Um, so to shrink them back down, it will have to be necessary to really uh, clean up that materials problem. Now that's kind of scary because uh, people have thought off and on for, for 50 years about how to clean up uh, atomic defects in materials and it hasn't been, you know, hasn't worked that well. So, um, uh, now, I think IBM has acknowledged they're not going to re shrink their superconducting qubits, and their cartoon of their million qubit thing is to have uh, like meter square chips and about a stack of a thousand of them. That's the cartoon I've seen, anyway. So, uh, so miniaturization may not, it's great for your cell phone, but it may not be great for quantum computers. Uh, great, thanks. And uh, next, another hardware question. <laughs> what is IBM's approach to handle the number of wires per qubit after the 1,000 qubit chip? Uh, transduction to a different signal? Um, I don't know. I don't think they've indicated. Um, I guess as the opinion of some of us is that they will eventually have to go digital. As I said, uh, I said, uh, give your, give your uh, quantum computer an IP address was the, uh, was the thing I said. Um, but I haven't heard any sign that they're thinking of doing that. Um, I know they are talking about compact wiring uh, uh, modules. So you have to think of, uh, you know, connectors that, you know, that have a thousand wires and you just go click and it uh, connects in. So very prosaic, uh, you know, things about making wires very packed in. They are not at all packed in now. I mean, there's 
physical space for way, way more, but, uh, but microwave engineers, analog engineers are very conservative about that, uh, maybe rightly so. So I, the short answer is I don't know uh, that they have any clear answer other than this dream of putting the electronics cold. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, presently, so. Um, okay, we relax for a while then. Yeah, exactly. I think we can uh, have our coffee break and we'll be back uh, at 11 with Jonathan Holmes' uh, hardware lecture on trapped ions. And once again, I'd like to thank the speaker. Thank you so much, Professor DiVincenzo. Uh, really, really enjoyed your talk. And it's great to see how well uh, these talks start to fit together as we <laughs> have a, uh, yeah. Okay, and I'll, uh, I guess I'll send to you um, an email of this or a, or a link to my Dropbox or something of, uh, of this uh, talk, um, slightly cleaned up, but uh, all the graffitos will remain though. Perfect, that sounds great. Okay. All right, thanks again.